tough when you open up your social media in the morning and you hear about all the awesome things happening at other churches. You know, it can be a little deflating when you see, oh, look, Elevation Church is going to launch their 45th campus on the moon. And, you know, you hear about all these people getting saved and they baptized 500 plus on the beach in California. That's true. Um, which is great, awesome. And then you kind of look at yourself and go, where's my revival? So I want to encourage you for just a moment and then uh, give you some, some tools for the toolbox. I love Christian history. I love stories of missionaries and martyrs. And one of my favorites was John Chrysostom, who lived back in the late 300s. He was the archbishop the Archbishop of Constantinople, and uh, one of my favorite head-to-head, -head, man, somebody should make a Hollywood movie about the life of John Chrysostom, because that guy was a maverick. He was full of spunk. He was not afraid to just get in people's face. I love that guy. I got him killed. And so John Chrysostom goes head-to-head -head with the Empress Eudocia, and she's trying to shut him up to stop the spread of Christianity in John Chrysostom stands his ground. And so these lines of dialogue, I just want to share with you to encourage you, whether you're at, at a mountaintop or a valley today, God's not done with you yet. So the Empress Eudocia was threatening banishment for John Chrysostom. That's how they would shut you up in the day. They just try to get you out of here just like they threw John on the island of Patmos. They would banish you. The, the Empress Eudocia threatens John Chrysostom with banishment. And he says this, I love the spunk, get this. He goes, you cannot banish me. And I can imagine just a little grin on his face. You cannot banish me for this world is my father's house. The Empress goes, but I will kill you. No, you cannot. For my life is hid with Christ in God, said John. I will take away your treasure, she threatened. No, you cannot. My treasure is in heaven, and my heart is there. The emperor said, but I will drive you away from your friend. You will have no one left. No, you cannot. But I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you, for there is nothing you can do to harm me. And I share those words echoing across the centuries just to encourage you before we dive into these leadership materials. If you're at a mountaintop experience in your ministry, awesome. I'm so excited for you. You're in the minority because the majority of church planters and leaders are in a valley. But always remember, don't grow on the mountaintop where it's snow-capped. Growth and vegetation crop up in the valleys. Take courage, like John Chrysostom. There is nothing that the enemy can throw at you. You are unstoppable. You are immovable. You are fearless. So if you've got a Bible, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we leap into some insanely practical insights on leadership. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'd invite you to get some strong coffee. Not the weak decaf stuff. Get the robust stuff that puts hair on your chest. Sorry, Allison. And get yourself a notebook. Jot stuff down. Scientific studies show that if you write it down, you retain it 15%. No, or type note. What? In Timothy chapter two. You might want to mute your screen so we don't get feedback on this uh, coaching call. Second Timothy two is the final words of Paul. Many of us have preached this. But the final last words of Paul, he's handing the leadership baton to Timothy. And so we are all Timothys. You all need a Paul in your life to pour into you, and you need a Titus to pour out. 
So every river needs water coming in. That's a Paul to a Timothy. And then you'll become stagnant, a cesspool, if you're not pouring out into a Titus. So find Tituses in your church and just say, hey, come follow me, shadow with me. Second Timothy chapter two, Paul says this, Timothy, my dear son, be strong with the special favor. Teach many things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. So Paul says, teach these great truths to trustworthy people who are able to pass them on to others. Verse three, he says, endure suffering. So on Monday morning, when you get your offering reports, you're enduring suffering. On Monday morning, when you go, oh, attendance dropped off a cliff, you're enduring suffering. <laughs> Endure suffering along with me. And here's the key. Here's the key. As a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And this was uh, Roman-occupied territory 2,000 years ago. Roman centurions everywhere. These are mighty warriors, brute strength. They don't wear deodorant, so they smell horrible and hairy. And Paul says that you and I are to be good soldiers. Roman soldiers would take territory, they would hold territory. Your church, your ministry is called to take ground and to hold the ground. As Robert Coleman once said in the Master Plan of Evangelism, we've not been called just simply to hold the fort, but to uh, chase after the heights. And so he says, be a good soldier of Christ Jesus, verse four, and as Christ's soldier, <laughs> singing that old song. From, I grew up in the 80s. Did you go to like a vacation Bible school or Sunday school where they sang the song, I'm in the Lord's army. We should totally do that this Sunday. No, don't do that. So as Christ's soldier, do not let yourself get tied up in the affairs of this life. So don't get bogged down with silly committee meetings. Don't get bogged down with the one rotten apple who sent you that big long email. Delete that person. Tell them, uh, to go find another church where they can get excited. <laughs> Somebody once wrote a big long email to the CEO of Southwest Airlines detailing everything that they did wrong because this guy needed a hobby. And the CEO of Southwest did not uh, change the airlines to accommodate this one squeaky wheel. He didn't give them free tickets for a, a flight. Here's what he sent. He sent a simple email back. We will miss you. And some of you just need to get the gift of goodbye and bless that person on the way out. Mm. Pruning is good for you. Pruning hurts in the moment, but it leads to health. John chapter 10. So don't get tied up in the affairs of this life, Paul says, because then you can't satisfy the one who enlisted you in the army in the first place. And so finally says in verse five, follow the Lord's teachings for doing his work, not somebody else's agenda. You stick to the vision that you've been entrusted with as the lead person. Just as an athlete either follows the rules or is disqualified and wins no prize. So worry about what Jesus has called you to. Don't go off the track trying to satisfy people in the stands. The loudest boos come from the cheapest seats. So Paul is talking about being a good soldier. And I wanted to take uh, a few minutes to unpack what they teach you in the Marine Corps. Do we have any Marine, Marines here? Yes, no, maybe so. So I, I have a friend who was in the Marine Corps from 91 to 2001. His name is Bill, and he just started talking about his time in the Marine Corps. And I started jotting down notes, and I discovered eight leadership lessons from the Marine Corps that apply to church leadership. So that's what I want to share with you this morning to encourage you to give you that, that extra oomph, eight leadership lessons from the Marine Corps. And this is based on 2 Timothy 2, be a good soldier, stay focused on the prize. These are common sense principles for success, whether you're a church planter or a movement leader, eight leadership lessons from the Marine Corps. So the first thing that they teach you in the Marine Corps is rapid 
decision making. Rapid decision making is key on the battlefield and it's key in your organization. As a leader, if you want to reach people far from God quickly, then you need to get comfortable with making rapid decisions. You can't fall into decision paralysis if you're really intent on people coming through your door who know nothing about Jesus, you have to get comfortable with rapid decision making. So the Marine Corps teaches uh, them to be making sound decisions and timely decisions. Traditionally in schools, when you go to middle school, high school, they indoctrinate us, they, they teach us to methodically analyze, to weigh the pros and cons. My mom would always say, make a list of the pros and the cons on your decision. And the whole idea, if you go after a business degree, is they say, minimize risk, minimize risk. But that's not what the Marine Corps teaches. And that's honestly not what uh, the heart of Paul was. Paul was, man, let's go reach lost people. I've got one life to live. He was planting on the Mediterranean rim. So he wasn't minimizing the risk in his decision making. Man, he just went out, took a beating, stood back up, started preaching, right? So here's what the Marine Corps teaches. My friend Bill told me. He says, uh, he called this the 75% solution. And I love this, the 75% solution. Share this with your next board meeting. 75% solution of the Marine Corps is this. Do your best to gain as much information as you can. And when you've got 75% of the data, use your intuition, use your expertise, use your experience to fill in the final 25%. I think that's awesome. When you're a Marine, when you're on the battlefield with chaos around you, they don't have time to wait to get 100% certainty. And so rapid decision making is like, okay, just tell me what I need to know. And when you feel like you've got 75%, the other 25 is your gut. In ministry, it's the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, men, it's your wife, honestly, right? That's the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life. Uh, sometimes it's godly counsel, but you only need 75% of the data. And then you go with your gut. You've got experience. You need to trust yourself. And what Bill was saying with rapid decision making is it's always better to make a decent decision, not a perfect decision. It's good to make a decent decision or even a mediocre decision and then aggressively execute it than to wait around and delay. Because in the heat of the battle, if you delay, you're going to get your squad killed. Decision paralysis is one of the big weights around the neck of the North American church. We need rapid decision makers. So that was the first uh, common sense principle from the Marine Corps that really stood out to me. And I don't care how big your church is. I've led churches of 10 people, I've led churches of 1200 people. Everybody has problems. Everybody has to make decisions. Um, big churches have the same problems as little churches. Their problems just have more zeros after it. So you've got to get comfortable with rapid decision making. You really do. Uh, there's no perfect decisions, by the way. There's not. And you're going to blow it sometimes. Just ask my staff. I made a bad hire earlier this year. <laughs> so everybody makes mistakes. All right, second thing, number two of eight. Uh, in the Marine Corps, they teach you decentralized decision making, decentralized decision making. I love this because if you want to position your church for growth, you've got to start decentralizing, right? If everything flows through the senior pastor, it's like, uh, you seen days of our lives. Did you guys ever watch days of our lives growing up? I got hooked on days of our lives in the 1980s, Roman. And uh, <laughs> this is horrible. And John Black shows up and there's Marlena, you know, you call it Doc. All right, these are inside jokes for Days of Our Lives fans. And so at, at the beginning, it's always the hourglass, right? As the sands of the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. And so if you're the senior leader, if you're the point leader, the campus leader, and everything runs through you, you are the hourglass. 
You are the bottleneck in your organization and you have to figure out how to decentralize. All right, so in the Marine Corps, they say push decision-making as far down the chain of command as possible. Make your organization more nimble. All right, so push the decision-making down. So volunteers, you, there's trash. You don't even come tell me about the trash. Make a decision, pick up the trash or assign somebody to clean the windows. That makes your organization more nimble. It creates more ownership on your team if people feel empowered to make decisions. And the Marine Corps has to have decentralized decision-making in combat. If there's rockets coming in, I mean, I've seen Saving Private Ryan. I've, I've watched these, these movies. Black Hawk Down, just watched it again a couple of weeks ago. Combat is chaotic. Combat is asymmetrical. It is unforgiving, just like Sunday mornings when you're trying to get ready for the sermon, right? It's chaotic. It's asymmetrical. It's, it's unforgiving. And so if you're in a combat situation, you have to decentralize decision-making. Everybody can't come running to you as the lead person or else you'll never get the sermon written. You'll never get to the FaceTime with the first time guests. You need to focus on only what you're good at and empower people to push the decisions down the chain of command. So pushing decisions up, produces bureaucracy. And nobody wants to go to church full of bureaucracy. That's why the Presbyterian church is hemorrhaging. Mm -hmm. I grew up Presbyterian. Uh, pushing decisions up the tree creates mediocrity. Pushing decisions up the tree creates missed opportunities. So you got to sit down with your team and they got to get your DNA. They got to get, get your team to start thinking like you. That's one of the biggest macro challenges that I'm facing at Life Church. I, I have an amazing staff, but they're all new. Within the last 12 months, everybody is new on staff. And so I'm having to learn how to teach them how I think. So when they're in a situation of, okay, what do I do? What do I do? They've already got the DNA. They've already got the vision that they can filter it through to make the decision, right? So um, you want to create a culture where the front line, which is your volunteers or your staff or your interns or your board, whatever, create a culture where the front line make decisions. When they make decisions, affirm them, celebrate it. What gets celebrated gets repeated. Create a culture where the front line is encouraged. This creates creativity, flexibility, and success. You know, tell your team, man, I would rather you ask for forgiveness than ask permission. Obviously, there's things that need to be asked permission. If you're going to spend $1,000, yeah, you need to ask permission. Don't ask forgiveness. Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor, I spent $10,000. No. Uh, but you want to get them thinking about asking forgiveness over permission. I would rather tame a lion on my team than push a donkey. I don't need donkeys on the team. And so this requires the senior leader to always be communicating what they want accomplished and why. And if people have the big picture, the what and the why, they feel more equipped and empowered to keep those decisions off your desk. Otherwise, you're getting bogged down with too much on your desk, piling up, and you're the bottleneck. That's why a lot of churches in America get stuck at 120. Everything goes to the senior leader. You guys tracking with me? The Marine Corps. That's the sec first, second, now here's the third. Number three out of eight. Third thing that Bill taught me from the Marine Corps that totally applies to what we're doing in church world. This is a hard one. Stay calm and composed during crisis. And crisis can be anything in church world. It can be the worship person didn't show up or uh, the special, it's not so special. Or <laughs> a kid just got their head cut off in the kid's area. Uh, you got to stay calm and composed during crisis. Leaders are made and broken in crisis. We just celebrated 9-11. Remember 9-11? And you think about the leaders who emerged on that day. Crisis reveals what you're made of. So 1 Timothy, real quick. 1 Timothy 4. Pull out some Bible. 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, um, spend your time and energy training yourself for spiritual fitness. He says spiritual exercise is important. It promises a reward in this life and the next. So 
you want to start training yourself. Assume there's going to be chaos. Assume there's going to be a crisis. In church planting, in church world, there's always a crisis. And if you can stay calm and composed, you're thinking like a Marine Corps leader. The Marines are taught to compartmentalize their emotions, to not go into freak out mode. Because the people under you don't need to see you melt down. They need to see you rise up. So you have to compartmentalize your emotions, right? Have a healthy release valve. So whether that's exercise or uh, you, you get like a, a, you know, we're gonna put some exercise equipment here at Life Church as a healthy release valve for our staff. So that when we're dealing with junk, we can stay calm and collected and then later go wailing on the exercise machine, right? The cardinal sin in Mar the Marine Corps is to lose your bearing. If you lose your bearing, you've lost everything. It's not about never being afraid. It's about getting comfortable with the idea that fear and vulnerability and uncertainty are normal. And I'll touch on that more in just a bit. It's not about eliminating chaos from your church. It's about exploiting the chaos to your benefit. So when things are going crazy, you walk into the room calm and composed and the temperature of the leader is going to affect everybody else in the situation. And then if you lead through that situation, you earn more trust and more chips in your leadership. So remember this, Marines are taught, you have complete control. You have complete power over how you choose to deal with obstacles. You're gonna have obstacles. Today, just trying to get ready for this weekend, you're gonna have obstacles. You can't choose the stuff that's gonna come across your desk. You can't choose the stress and the curveballs, but you do have control over how you deal with them. Your reaction is what you have control over. So Marines are taught the story you tell yourself is how you view the obstacle. So 2 Timothy, when Paul says you're a soldier, don't worry about civilian life. Focus on the one who called you. You tell yourself, yeah, that's, that's my lineage. I am of the lineage of John Chrysostom. You can't take anything away from me, right? This church could fall apart and I'm still okay. When you've got that calcium in your spine, the story you tell yourself is how you view the obstacle. Your power comes from the story you're telling yourself and from the spirit that lives within you. And if you're ever doubting yourself, which happens a lot in ministry, dude, call me, give me five minutes on the phone with you. I'll help you through that. Chaos is the norm, stay calm. That's number three. Tracking with me? Now we're at the halfway point. Number four, the fourth big thing they teach you is this, and this is not anything uh, revolutionary. Sure. Number four, they teach you it's never about you. In the Marines, they say it's not about you. It's not about you. The Marine Corps, you are always reminded that it's never about the senior leadership. So if you're the church planter or the campus pastor or the leader of the children's area, it's not about you. It's about the people you serve and the team God has entrusted to your care, i.e. you're a shepherd, they're sheep. So when you're in the Marines, the primary mission of the senior leader is to take care of and support the 18-year-old scared infantrymen. That's your job, is to support and take care of the weakest and the youngest. That's your job too. It's not about you. And so in the Marines, um, the leaders always eat last. There's a great book by Simon Sinek called Leaders Eat Last. So all the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the regular guys, the newbies, they go to the front of the line. The senior leadership eats last. Kind of reminds me of what Jesus taught, right? <laughs> James and John are fighting over, I want to sit next to you. I want, to, I want the good seats, like your kids in the car, right? And Jesus says, no, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Officers in the Marine Corps exist to provide cover, to remove obstacles, and to create an environment 
where the engine of the Marine Corps can be successful. So let me repeat that because that applies to your ministry teams. You exist to provide cover. You take cover for your people, right? So here's the deal. I've been in too many churches where if somebody doesn't like something, they go straight to the senior pastor and complain. I don't like this staff person because blah, 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 blah. I grew up in that church. I've worked at that church. That church sucks. All right. Because number one, Matthew 18, go to the person. So here's how you show that you're taking cover for your people. Marine Corps, man, they'll jump on a grenade. I'll jump on a grenade for my staff and my interns. Right. Anybody comes to me and complains about my staff or interns, I will have their back 110%. You will never see me throwing a staff or intern person under the bus with somebody that just attends our church. Will not happen. I will take cover. Even if what they did was wrong, dude, I will shut that complainer down. Then I'll go talk to the staff person privately, uh, but, but I will jump on a bomb for them because I need my team to know that they have my complete trust. If there's something wrong, they'll hear about it from me quickly privately and humbly. It takes a lot to get me angry, right? But I take, I provide cover for my staff or my intern. Do your people feel that same way? If you have a team of volunteers under you, have you communicated to them clearly, I've got your back. If a parent comes and complains about you and you're my volunteer, I'm gonna have your back, right? I'm gonna love that parent, but I'm not gonna throw a volunteer under the bus. So officers exist to provide cover. They remove obstacles. Your job is to equip the people you're leading. So if you're the head of staff, are you equipping your staff? Are you listening to your staff? Are you, do, are you approachable? Are you removing the obstacles? Are you clearing the brush? And that's an ongoing thing. And officers exist to create an environment where the engine of the Marine Corps can be successful. So the senior leadership is trying to thrust the spotlight onto the people under them because it's never about you. All right, we're at 50%. We're halfway there. These next ones go faster. You ready? The fifth big thing they teach you in the Marine Corps. I love this one. This is my favorite. Three words. This is my absolute favorite. I, I would almost tattoo this on my chest. It'd be amazing. Three words they teach you in the Marine Corps. Number five, improvise, adapt, overcome. Wouldn't that be a great t-shirt? Improvise, adapt, overcome. I think that's amazing. And that's a mantra that they teach every Marine. Improvise, adapt, overcome. Hello, if you're a church planter, you are always improvising. You are always adapting. You're always overcoming. If you're a leader of a large organization, you still have to improvise. You have to create new systems and structures to deal with the people. You still have to adapt and you still are gonna overcome the obstacle. So in the Marines, listen, the Marine Corps are your resource. That's the biggest challenge, Bill, tell me. And it's because they're the smallest branch that's competing for funds. So they never have enough money for office supplies or for equipment. Um, they're just always under-resourced, but he said that that's become an advantage because they have to become more resourceful. They have to learn how to improvise, adapt, and overcome, and that makes you a better leader. It's not about having enough resources. It's about becoming resourceful with what God has given you. You will never have enough resources. If you're a church planter, you are constantly going to be in fundraising mode. I'm five years into this, man. I'm always fundraising. It's not fun, but it's your job. If you're the leader of a larger church, you're still not going to have enough resources. If you've got people coming to Christ, there's a six to 12 month lag time between someone discovering the joy and the privilege of generosity. You will never have enough resources for the amount of people coming through your doors. So you have to figure out how do I improvise, adapt, and overcome? Malcolm Gladwell, who's an amazing author, you should read everything by Malcolm Gladwell. He taught that there's a high percentage of United States presidents who had a disadvantage in life that caused them to improvise, adapt, and overcome. 
And what that uh, deficit was, was growing up left-handed in a right-handed culture. When you grew up left-handed, my father's left-handed, my daughter's left-handed, you're already getting ink on your hand when you're writing your name and everything in this world is about, you know, you turn right, you know, and when you're driving a car, if you turn left, it's harder. And so there's all these hurdles and obstacles, but what it does for U.S. presidents like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and I believe George W. Bush, they were all left-handed. And so he saw that there's a high percentage of U.S. presidents who grew up left-handed, learned how to improvise, adapt, and overcome, and it ignites initiative. It ignites an entrepreneurial spirit, and it made them better leaders. So whatever you're facing, that obstacle, you got to see it as an opportunity. That's the deal with church planting. You don't have time for a pity party, and we'll get to that in a second. Leadership, listen, if you see every obstacle as an opportunity, that's not being naive, that's leadership. And so I love challenges. I was just talking to a staffer yesterday about a challenge we're facing. I'm like, I love this stuff. This actually energizes me because I have to think of how to improvise, adapt, and overcome. A uh, couple quick resources to help you in that. This book, and I'm not making any money off this. This is just stuff I love. Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey is a must read. This is one of the two books I read that we founded Life Church on. This is all about best business practices, how to be an entrepreneur in leadership. Excellent book. They got a free podcast. Um, another book that I read once a year, Go Big by Bill Ezum and Bill Cornelius. This one's super short. It's out of print, but you can still get copies on Amazon. Go Big is fantastic. Horrible cover. Horrible cover. Don't judge that. Great material, right? It's double space, so it's an easy read. Those two books have been instrumental to my life in Improvise, Adapt, Overcome. Of course, the third book you should read is Holy Shift. All right. So, number six, six out of eight. We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Number six, the sixth thing they teach you in the Marine Corps, endurance and tenacity. That's ministry. It's about endurance, man. That's why Paul is always talking about press on book of Philippians. It's on your coffee mug. Don't lie. Right. I press on for the, so endurance and tenacity Marines face impossible circumstances. You face impossible circumstances. It requires mental endurance. You got to get yourself at a good mental place. If you're not there, go see a counselor. All right. Everybody needs to see a Christian counselor. I see a Christian counselor. I love my Christian counselor. He's awesome. Get yourself a good Christian counselor. They'll help you get the mental endurance. I do not believe that there's a thing called burnout. I don't. I think burnout is a myth we've invented in the 20th century. I don't read about any of the apostles having burnout. I read about them having boldness. I see Stephen in the book of Acts. He doesn't say, oh, hey, you know what? I'm burning out. This is just too much. These guys are banging up on me. No, he just keeps preaching until they kill him. I think burnout is simply taking yourself too seriously. You take yourself too seriously when you don't talk to people. So get yourself a safe person. If you can't talk to your spouse, talk to a counselor or talk to both. I'm married to a spouse who is a counselor and I still see a Christian counselor. That's how you avoid burnout. Right? If you need a safe person, call me. I'll be a safe person. I promise I will not stab you in the back. I won't. I'll listen, and then I'll tell you, stop it. All right? You want endurance and tenacity to press on. It's a mental game. Any challenges now in your life are just here to prepare you for future challenges ahead. That's what the Marines are taught. Overcome this challenge, and it prepares you for a bigger challenge ahead. Marines have no time for pity parties. Imagine watching them seeing Private Ryan and people start, oh, this is hard. I'm burned out. I need a vacation. Nobody cares. I feel unappreciated. If you get a paycheck from your church, you're appreciated. So shut up. This is hard. Listen, dude, I was in Nepal a couple months ago. There's a guy I've been talking about this tonight at Vision Night. There's a guy who wrecked my life. He's an unpaid church planter. By the way, it's illegal 
to talk about Jesus in Nepal. And this guy has a written plan. He showed it to me of how he's going to start a hundred churches in 10 years. And he's already like gathering people and he's leading the Christ. And then he starts discipling them right away. And I'm like, here I am whining about our church. Just, you know, we're just trying to do, 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 do. And this dude on the other side of the world has no money, no people, no resources, threat of imprisonment. And he's not throwing a pity party. Jesus Christ, his friends, he was slaughtered. He did not throw a pity party in that cave. So you don't have permission to throw a pity party. Marines don't cry. It's like Tom Hanks in a league of their own. You can't cry. There's no crying in baseball. All right. If you feel like crying, call me. Okay. Uh, look, the challenges you're facing are not unique. I promise you. I don't have enough money for my ministry. Join the club. I don't have people are doing that. That's why we do coaching. That's why we have each other. That's why you just call me. Right but what you're facing is not unique. That should give you hope that there is an answer. You just have to chase it down. And listen, George Otis once said this, one of my favorite quotes, God almost never calls his people to a fair fight. God almost never calls his people to a fair fight. So if you're facing overwhelming odds, good. Because that's the apostle Paul's life. And the Marines are taught never quit. Endurance, tenacity, it's a mental game. Never quit. Never, never, never quit. If you're thinking of quitting, call me. And if it's the healthy thing to do for you to transition out, man, I will walk with you through that. Um, but, but don't just like say, I don't want to ever get that email, John, I quit. No, talk to somebody first. All right. Number seven, seventh thing they teach in the Marine Corps, seven out of eight. Fear and uncertainty are the norm in leadership. Touched on it earlier, but fear and uncertainty, that's normal. You should be experiencing that in your church or ministry. You should be a little afraid and uncertain. It never goes away. Smooth seas never made a skilled sailor. Fear and uncertainty is the norm. And so in the Marine Corps, Bill was telling me that they teach uh, maneuver warfare. Maneuver warfare is to shock, disrupt, and introduce organized chaos to the situation. And when you learn to operate comfortably in an environment of fear and uncertainty, then you will always have the advantage. So it goes back to being calm and collected, number two on the list. Fear and uncertainty is the norm but if you can operate comfortably in that environment, you will always have the advantage in your church. People will always look to you for guidance and leadership is influence. If you want more influence, be a voice of calm and control when there's fear and uncertainty. Fear and uncertainty give a leader job security. That's the job of a leader, to step into fear and uncertainty. And so it gives you job security. Don't run from it. The last thing that Bill said that they uh, teach Marines is the value of loyalty and love. And it's not something that's taught. It's something that's caught. And you get that from the, the series that was filmed 17 years ago, Band of Brothers. There's an unspoken loyalty and bond and trust and a love. You never leave someone behind. When the people under your care know that you care, they'll jump off a cliff for you. Everything in life is built on trust. Leadership is influence. You can't influence people unless they trust you. And trust is from unspoken loyalty and love. How can you show love to the people God has brought under your care? It could be a simple handwritten card I'm, dude, I'm still writing handwritten cards to people. It can be a simple post on somebody's Facebook saying, attaboy. It can be showing up at their child's birthday party. Yeah, you don't have time for it, but if you make 20 minutes, that goes a long way. How can you communicate love and loyalty to your team, to your volunteers, to your congregation? Because Marines know that I've got brothers who have my back, 
and my brothers know I have their back. And so together, united, we are unstoppable. Acts chapter 4, verse 32, all the believers are united in heart and soul. I'm talking about it this Sunday at Life Church. An unstoppable movement of God is when the people of God are united under the Jesus flag. You're the one that's hoisting up the Jesus flag. You are Iwo Jima. You're the one hoisting it up, the leader. How can you show and demonstrate love and trust? So those are the eight leadership lessons from the Marine Corps. Tons of great stuff there. Um, Paul says to be a good soldier. And so we can learn. We can take a page from that. Listen, people say, can you learn leadership outside of the Bible? Yes. I'm sola scriptura. I'm a Bible guy, but I'm not solo scriptura, right? All truth is God's truth. And so if the Marine Corps can help me uh, fearlessly lead my church to growth, absolutely, I want to learn from the Marines. We've got 15 minutes left for any questions you guys have or any situations that um, you can present that maybe I can help you through. And so I'll give you a second to think of questions. Another book to throw out there. This book has not been released yet, but uh, I have an advanced copy and I'd recommend this already. Is this book, Spirit Filled Jesus, Live by His Power by Mark Driscoll. Uh, they're doing pre order on Amazon and stuff, but um, it's, it's actually really good. It's shorter than most of Driscoll's books. It is humbler. Um, if you know Driscoll's life story over the last five years, and I've known Driscoll for years, you can tell that his approach to scripture, his approach to teaching has shifted into an area of grace and it's healthy. And the material covered in here is really, really good. So uh, this is what I'm reading right now and just wanted to recommend it to you guys. Spirit-filled Jesus, Mark Driscoll. I'm not making any money off that. I just found it to be a good resource. What can I do to help you guys? How can I serve you? What, what questions or situations do you have? Bueller, anything? Bueller. Would it be helpful to you guys? Uh, we're doing vision night tonight and tomorrow. We're doing, it's the same material both nights. Would it be helpful if we live streamed it like on Instagram so that it's not saved? We don't want it to be saved and shared. But would it be helpful if would either of any of you guys be interested in seeing that? It's from 7 to 8 Eastern time. It's, it's vision I'm casting and... Yeah, I'd love to see it. So, Ian, let's do that. Let's let's try to live stream it on Instagram tonight. It won't be like uh, top-notch production quality. It'll just be on an iPhone. But we'll live stream it. I'm excited. Uh, God changed the message this morning at 6 a.m. It's awesome. It's scary. That, that's the kind of stuff that scares me, but I like to be scared. Any questions or anything that, that I can help you with in these, these closing moments? What was number eight? Loyalty and love. Okay. Loyalty and love. It's unspoken. So in the Marines, they don't like on the chalkboard, we're going to teach you about love. It's something that's not taught, but it's caught. And you, you get that. Once a Marine, always a Marine. There's a loyalty. There's an unspoken bond. It's an honor code, but it's based in love. And you cannot lead people if you do not love people. People can very quickly sniff out if you're using them to fill a spot on your team. And so your challenge as a leader is to always figure out how can I demonstrate love? Um, and perhaps uh, we did a conference call last week with Perry Noble, which I think you guys have access to, the subscribers. Um, and he said, you may just go through the five love languages with Gary Chapman and figure out how are, how's God wired each of your staff or each of your volunteers. And then you know how to love on them. So if they like notes, notes of affirmation, a couple times a year, send them a note, you know, uh, acts of service, go mow their lawn. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm an acts of service guy. So I'm always blown away if someone does something, like if someone sets up the chairs, that speaks love to me. I'm like, oh, wow, they cared enough. They cared about what I care about, you know, that kind of thing. Torian, how can we encourage you, buddy? 
You doing good? He's doing so good that he's like. Torian, you there, buddy? Well, I gave Torian an assignment last night, the raising 30K in 30 days. We just uploaded the audio yesterday. So make sure you grab that. That is excellent stuff. We do that every year at Life Church. Nonprofits have to raise funds. It's not fun, but there's a, a strategy behind how to do that. And uh, how to raise 30K in 30 days goes into some of the psychology of it um, and the scripture. And so we just upload the audio. There's a master resource. And then I think there's even an example of, of a fundraising letter. So that's good stuff there. See, Christian looks like the Unabomber. He's uh, darkened out. Whoa! Any other questions before we, before we say adios for today? I got a, a real quick one, John. So um, we are all volunteers at this point. Like I'm, I'm the only staff member. So how- That's great. It, you don't have any overhead costs. That's, that's awesome. right. No overhead. How in the beginning, how were you doing this stuff with volunteers who, you know, I mean, they're not in the office every day. You can't pull a weekly staff meeting, that kind of stuff. How do you drive some of these values down to people who you're seeing on Sunday morning or just fighting to get time with? So number one, um, you know what the statistical turnover rate is for a church plant with your volunteers. The statistical turnover rate within two years, you're going to have a turnover rate of 100%. Right. Um, and so for Life Church, yep, yep, 100%. <laughs> so it's disheartening because you're going to invest in people. And I know you're in year three, but if you have new volunteers, it can still apply to them. Yeah. So, so the, the thing you got to get mentally prepared for is, I can, I'll tell you in a second how to invest in them, but uh, in two years, they may not be on the team. And right. so be mentally prepared for that. That's okay. Either they'll leave to bless another ministry. And so then you, you just bless them on the way out. And you, when people ask, hey, we're so-and-so, you just say, hey, sometimes God doesn't call people to a church. He calls people through a church. Hmm. Okay. Okay. playing Jovi in a glory. We, did, we had that two years ago. Um, our entire band and tech team all quit at the same time. It was awesome. It hurt. It was painful. But two years later, we are the healthiest we've ever been. So God prunes, John chapter 10. Hurts in the moment, but it leads to greater fruit. And another church plant popped up in town earlier this year. They have our entire band and tech crew. And I'm happy that we helped launch their church. Mm. Praise God. More people are getting saved. So you, just, you have to always see the opportunity in the obstacles, okay? So here's what I would do, Adam. Um, and you may have already done these things, but just real quick, rapid fire. I'd set up a private Facebook group, and it's VIP only for your leaders so that they have uh, private access to you to share prayer requests, to share inside notes and things. Um, so, for example, we have a lot of different private groups at Life Church now. One of them is just for band and tech. And so every Sunday, we're trying to just get little snippets, one, two minutes on iPhone of what's happening on the stage. We'll post it, and then we'll say, hey, everybody, watch this. You know, get over the pain of watching yourself and look at how the lights look. Look at how the, did the screens cues work. What do you look like physically on stage? And you can learn a ton just watching one, two-minute clips. We don't put that on the public Facebook stuff. We don't want that shared. So we just say it's internal use only. It's private. And that's one way to equip your people. Super, super easy. Um, you can give them access, you're a subscriber, give them access to the systems and docs and into these videos. Um, send it to them, just say, hey, I want you to take one hour this week and watch this video because you want to help them think the way that you think. Um, and, and hey, if you're one of those volunteers and a leader is showing you this video, your leadership loves you and cares about you so much that they are equipping you with quality world-class leadership materials. Get them books. Go Big would be a great book because it's an easy read. It's exciting. It pumps you up. And just buy a couple copies. Say, hey, everybody read this. Next week, I want you to each on this Facebook page, take five minutes and say one thing that you learned because um, you're influencing their thinking. Uh, use your social media 
<clears throat> to influence your leaders. So tell everybody to follow you on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, have the same name on all three, otherwise people forget. And so right now mine is High Five John, whether you're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I tell people just find me at High Five John, um, which you can do, <clears throat> you can totally steal that idea, just put High Five Adam or whatever, I think it's funny. There's no reason for that high five. Um, and then use your social media to influence them. If you're watching Mark Driscoll preach, if something stands out to you, put it out there. I do it all the time. If I, if I go to, I don't go to a lot of conferences, but if I do, I write down my notes because writing is better than typing. And then I take a photo of my notes and I post it. And dude, I get a ton of likes because people are hungry to be fed. So you can be even taking the notes from this, take a photo of your page, post it, maybe even tag some of your key leaders and say, hey, take a look at this. And, and you're influencing your leaders. Um, and you'll quickly learn in your church who are potential leaders because they're the ones who are not in official leadership, but they're sharing your content. So they're influencers. They're commenting, they're liking. That means they're hungry. Um, and so then you know, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of Taylor. Hmm, I wonder, blah, 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 blah. So those are ways to, to do that. It's hard to hold volunteers accountable. So what I would do is write up a job description because a written job description gives them something to look at. It makes it more official and more important. And I would say, uh, you're going to be my kids director for the next six months. So that there's a beginning, middle and end. So you're not looking for volunteers to give their lives away. Say, oh, it's just a six month commitment. There's a crash course at the beginning. At the end of six months, we sit down and evaluate. If they do a great job, then you up for another six months. If they do a horrible job, psh, it's an easy out. So you can do written job descriptions. Um, be careful of giving the title of pastor to anybody or, or elder or whatever your terms are, because once you give that title, you can't take it away. It is so hard to take it away. Um, we're really careful about titles here. Um, but yeah, those are some things I would do real easily. Awesome. Thank you. All the work. Your job is Ephesians 4, figure out how can I, you know, how could I pass it off? And so the systems and docs stuff is super, super helpful. So what if they're not paid staff? Just be like, okay, you're going to do this, this, and this. And we're going to change the world. We're going to act like a church that's twice our size now so that when we become twice our size in December, we're already ready to accommodate the people. So that's what I would do. All right, mark your calendars. Two weeks from today, Wednesday, September 26th, we will be here live 8 a.m. Eastern time. It's going to be fun. And uh, invite your ministry friends, man. We just want to help people and encourage them and equip them. If there's anything that we can do, please shoot us a line. Hello at lifechurchmichigan.com. And if you tune into Instagram tonight, hopefully around 7.15, uh, we'll try and live stream at high quality and it will not be posted. So once it's off, it's off. And you can pray for me because I'm a little scared, but that's good. I love you guys. You're doing awesome, awesome work. Be strong and courageous. And we'll see you guys in two weeks. Have a great day. Thank you.